I'm Mark Dresner, and welcome to the Research Insider, a special executive interview series with market research and consumer insights leaders and experts, each of whom will be featured at the Market Research Event 2011, the most comprehensive conference in the world dedicated to elevating the business value of insights, taking place November the 7th through the 9th in Orlando, Florida. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Ruben Alcaraz, Manager of Consumer Insights for Meyer. Ruben, thank you for joining us. Mark, thanks for having me. Please, why don't we start with a little bit about your current role and responsibilities? Sure. I am currently the Consumer Insights Manager for Meyer. Uh, my responsibility includes overseeing all of the um, primary research, which includes quantitative, uh, qualitative, as well as the uh, syndicated research, which is uh, Nielsen, MPD, perishable group, and the uh, mm-hmm. secondary research and such, and overlaying with analytics. Terrific. And before we really dive into the good stuff here, I, I want to point out to our listeners that your background, just for context, is pretty important here. Can you tell us briefly about where you've been and how those experiences have influenced how you approach consumer insights and research today at Meyer? Sure. When, when I look at uh, my career, I, I've realized that I've, I've worked in actually a lot of different areas, all, but for the same subject. I've worked in research and insights my entire career. I started in South America working in primary research, working for the big blue chips companies down uh, down there, which is Coca-Cola, Unilever, et cetera, and um, that was as a vendor. Then eventually uh, moved back to the U.S. and began working on more of the point-of-sale information or the syndicated data with the manufacturer and looking, looking at promotions, activities, and things, like, and things like that. I spent with Nielsen for about five years, and my biggest clients at the time were Kraft Foods and some of the Hollywood studios such as Disney, Sony Pictures, Home Entertainment, etc., Eventually, I also began working on on the research from the manufacturer side, and lately I've been working for the past three years on the retail side, which has allowed me to look at information from all these different areas and aspects. So when, when I look at information, I see, well, what did I look at when I was a supplier? What did I look at when I was a manufacturer? And how do I look at it now that I'm a retailer? You've really got, and you just nailed that, the, what I'll call the trifecta of experience. You've, you've got all, the, all three key perspectives, and I want to focus on research now from the retailer's perspective, your current perspective, because based on our previous conversation, it appears that there are some disconnects perhaps and some gaps that both manufacturers and research providers need to be aware of when engaging retailers in the research process. First of all, let's talk about project scope because that seems to be an opportunity, especially where manufacturers are concerned. Uh, Can you please tell us why this is important to a retailer and what can be done to sort of close the gap, if you will? Sure. When the manufacturers begin thinking of the research process, and, and they actually follow the right approach, but usually the, the execution is not well thought of all the time um, because we, they begin working either internally or they work with uh, third parties who take the approach, who don't realize that the retail environment is a living, breathing environment. So, for example, mm-hmm. when it's common for me to get r- requests to do research in 20 stores or so, which for, for us is actually prohibitive. We couldn't do that just because there would be too much of a disruption on our customers. And, and also, they, the research typically tends to be done during the uh, key shopping hours, which are the midday and, and the afternoon. Uh-huh. And sometimes they even want to do it on the weekend, which is when most customers tend to shop their store. But again, uh, they need to remember that customers are not there to take surveys, they're there to shop. So the inconvenience can be counterproductive for the retailer. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And in our earlier conversation, you also referenced execution, logistical detail as an area of disconnect. For example, it's not uncommon for you to receive project specs that may involve, as say, as many as 30 stores. And at face value, this might seem reasonable to someone else, but in fact, it can pose a huge problem for you. What do manufacturers need to take into account when they make these sort of requests? 
I believe what they need to take into account is, uh, I mean, for lack of a better term, they need to put put themselves in, in the other side's shoes. So, for example, for, from the op- operational standpoint, for them to make concessions and to allow people into the stores, there actually there are quite a lot of steps that need to be followed from the legal aspect. So, for example, we can't just turn loose people talking to our customers around the stores or, or having them walking around with um, with those eyeglasses measuring what's going on. It's too disruptive. Also, mm-hmm. they may take a lot of space in the aisles and also where, where they set up within the store. It could be a hindrance to other customers who are there to shop who are not currently participating in the study. And uh, the amount of time that it takes to go through each one. And I'm thinking specifically shop alongs right now and not just intercepts. Um, Mm -hmm. I will give you an example where we had a situation of a manufacturer who was doing research. And, for example, we set up a time window for, let's say, from 11 till 2. Well, they didn't show up in the store until 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And for us, that we can't just adapt to that just mm-hmm. because now, now they're hitting on a key time of the day for our customer. And just to, just to take a step back real quickly, logistics. So if someone requests to do research in 30 stores, why is scale an issue for you? Scale is just an issue for us just from the standpoint that uh, we are a regional player. So Mm -hmm. for us to allow research on 30 stores takes a uh, a lot of coordination. And uh, we gotta we gotta talk to different market directors and we gotta communicate to the specific store directors. We gotta get all of the legalities for each of the states that that may be that may be in play all align it's not a turnkey operation and um, also again a lot of times what tends to happen is the manufacturer may contract the company to do the research and the company can could potentially subcontract other companies to come to the store which means okay now we need to have do everything all the paperwork and everything for each of those individual companies that are going to be coming in to our stores and talking to our customers. So from your perspective, it's actually quite onerous, even though you know it might seem like a relatively reasonable request to a manufacturer. There's a lot of moving parts and considerations that need to be taken into account when you're undertaking something on that scale. Absolutely. Um, let's switch gears. Cost is always top of mind when you're discussing research, but for retailers, this is an especially important area. In our previous discussion, you had hinted that a one-size-fits-all cost structure does not work for retail. Is the current model broken, and how should a research provider go about thinking about this as they as they look at projects and and from a cost perspective. Sure, I don't know if I would call the model, uh, model broken so much as it is. It needs to be tweaked to be more flexible. Mm-hmm. So, um, I've, and I've been having a lot of conversation around this topic lately. So, just I think it's better if I start answering just to give you an example. You know, because mm-hmm. of the scale of manufacturers who co- who work globally and nationally. And it is more cost-effective for market research firms to to develop a methodology that aligns to, let's say, 90% of what a manufacturer is looking for. Mm-hmm. Now, when you start flipping that model and try to bring it specifically to, to the retailer, well, a particular regional one, the way we look at information, the way we slice our geography, the way we segment our customers may not be the same as the the way the manufacturer looks at it. So now all of a sudden that gap of uh, when they were delivering that model to the manufacturer is only 10% off. When when they get it to the man to the retailer is now off by 40, 50 points. Mm-hmm. So at that point you start questioning the validity. Now. That combined with the fact that the prices are not always aligned to what retailers used to to paying for it. So, for example, it I believe it's the manufacturers see a lot of value. If I'm going to get if I'm going to get answers that nine out of ten times are going to be okay, but mm-hmm. if as a, as a retailer, if you if if I'm going to be charged the same amount of money, but only I'm going to be right only half the time, mm-hmm. then I need to start questioning whether whether or not that investment is valid. So it's not only a matter of of scarce resources, if you will, comparatively speaking, 
but also prioritizing and also of homogenization, if you will, or getting uniform standards, definitions, et cetera, on the table before moving forward. Is that safe to say? Right. So yeah. uh, just to add a little bit more to, to your mm -hmm. comment, uh, sure. that's, why I, that's why I really do believe that the model needs to be flexible. An another example that I can provide to that is we do our development in-house, right? We develop quite a few products throughout the year where, for example, specific manufacturers, they, they, they may have business units or divisions that develop one or two per year. So it is more cost effective for them to, to think about, well, I'm going to have one or two this year and I, I'm going to spend up front just to make sure that it's I'm hitting all the toll gates and everything is successful moving forward. Mm -hmm. But our standpoint, uh, you know, it's, it isn't cost effective to spend large sums of money across each individual product that we're developing. Right. So the, the sheer number of products that you're developing versus, say, a manufacturer is, you know, makes it, makes it untenable to devote those kinds of resources to each single product that you're looking at. And perhaps that's a, clearly an area where manufacturers need to really take that into consideration when they're talking to a retailer. Mm -hmm. How about, th these are, I think, the, this will be the final topic that we cover, and I think that it's perhaps the most important because at the end of the day, if you don't have results, as you, as you kind of alluded to earlier, you really have wasted a lot of time and resources. Usage and implementation of recommendations is where I want to go here. And essentially, research partners frequently and not surprisingly often recommend more displays, shelf space, promotional tactics, geographical distribution, etc. And in a previous conversation you and I had, you referenced what I'll refer to as an hourglass model and that this should be applied to recommendations coming your way. Can you tell our listeners a little bit more about what you mean by this hourglass model? Sure. There is a lot of work that goes in from the manufacturer side into creating a research, performing the research and delivering the insights to the manufacturers. There's no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. The part that I always witness, not always, but a lot of manufacturers kind of falling short is the implementation of their insights. So for example, they may come in with, okay, so we got this program. We really think it's going to help you. These are the customers that you're going to hit, and these are the tactics that we believe you should use. Well, the hourglass model, that, in, in, in the way I think of it, that would be the top of the hourglass model. So, so you, you, look at, you look at the what, the what now, the so what, and, and mm -hmm. what do you do. Now, from the retail aspect, they need to go a step beyond and take the what do you do and applying it to, what are the, what are the operational limitations? So, for example, if if you're gonna put it, if you're gonna say that we need to do pallets, well, is that gonna take labor in the store? Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, if you're gonna, what is the space that you're gonna take away from? And the space that you take them from, are you gonna bring in more revenue than the space that than the items that are being displaced? Uh -huh. um, then. Um, you need to look at from all these different aspects, logistical, and oh, and one more thing is the ability to measure what the success of all of these recommendations are above and beyond just the straight baseline and incremental that you typically get from organizations such as Nielsen. So, for mm -hmm. example, the insight sometimes may be, well, you're going to bring in this type of customer. Well, when you when you deliver pallets or you deliver end caps, well, how do we know that we're going to get this type of customer? Uh -huh, uh -huh. So going above and beyond and adding the, this is, how, this is how we propose that you look at and use this tool so you can be sure that we're delivering not only on the insights and not only on the sales goals and not only on the margins and not only are we making your life easier from the operational aspects of things. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So going going above and beyond that. Okay, here we think we think you should have more uh, end cap or run this promotion during this time period. Yeah. So essentially, and taking everything into context, and I think that labor and operations, for example, is is a great is a great example of that. It, there are intangibles, I think, that manufacturers don't take into account that will you know affect that will cost the retailer, and and it might not be an obvious you know, standout type of cost, but certainly things that, that they really need to take into account, like uh, how much manpower am I pulling to, 
you know, execute based on your recommendations, et cetera, as well as what is the opportunity cost for, you know, versus what I'm already doing. So, you know, taking all of that into context. Right. So, um, and just to add a little more to that, so mm-hmm. the the analysis up front may say, oh yeah, you 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 could bring, let's say, twenty percent incremental business in dollars, but you know what, the labor that's going to have to be applied, well, that's going to eat up fourteen percent or fifteen percent of those incremental dollars. So net mm-hmm. net, let's say we we could create an all of this change across the entire chain just for a five percent increment, where you may have another tactic or strategy that may may have a higher payout if the if if the approach has taken into account all of those aspects. Well, I think that you've given us a really unique take that uh certainly manufacturers as well as as research providers themselves can walk away with here because I think it's a voice that really needs to be heard a little more often and that is the perspective of the retailer and why retailers react the way they do when confronted with certain you know, research proposals. On that note, I want to conclude this episode of the Research Insider. For those listening, if you're interested in hearing more from Ruben Alcarez, he'll be speaking at the Market Research Event 2011 on the topic of breakthrough applications in data visualization. And for more information, or of course to register for the Market Research Event 2011, taking place November 7th through the 9th in Orlando, Florida, please visit us online at themarketresearchevent.com. Until next time, this is Mark Dresner, and you've just heard the Insight Scoop.